Okay, good evening again, everybody. Um, welcome to a Jaminar. Um, this evening, we will be having the first Jaminar in the series, starting up today is Thursday um, in the East, or Jamaica time, Thursday, August 13th, and this is um, 6, uh, 6.07 p.m. Jamaica time, 7.07 .07 Eastern time. And of course, it's a little past 3 a.m. Shari's time in, in the Middle East. Um, now, this Jaminar is known as um, teaching students with learning disabilities in the general ed classroom um, inclusive practices. We are going to go through these. Um, as way of introduction, um, uh, Miss Shari N. Franklin, she grew up in Jamaica, um, where she is proud of uh, um, formative education received there in Jamaica. After graduating high school, um, Shari moved to the U.S. for college um, with a master's degree in special ed and certificate in administration and supervision. Shari has worked both as a teacher and as an administrator in the field. Currently, she works in Abu Dhabi as special education coordinator in an international school. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, Miss Shari Franklin, and I'm going to hand over to her to do her thing. Thank you very much, uh, Miss Franklin. Hi, good, after, good evening. Good evening, everyone. Thanks again um, to JD Tan for inviting me to do this workshop. I'm right now looking at a screen, my screen. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Can you see my screen? Okay, good. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. Um, uh, so yes, we're going to work on today, or we're going to talk about teaching students uh, with learning disabilities in the general education classroom. Thank you to those of you who in the chat started um, me off with your greatest challenges um, that you have. Um, and all of those challenges that you have written have um, exist everywhere, uh, but we can get into it. Uh, a little bit later. Let me say that if you were with us for the uh, seminar, the virtual seminar uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, the presentation is a little bit similar. The difference this time is that we're going to be able to do a little bit of breakout and problem solve with some simple cases, um, which should be a lot of fun as well and informative. I've been doing this a long time, and I will say that as time has gone on, things have gotten better in the world of special education, even at home. Uh, the story that I shared the last time was that as a student in high school, I could see uh, that there were classmates of mine that were struggling, and the lack of resources to engage those students was so significant, um, the behavioral challenges, etc or so significant as a student, I could even see them. And that is what um, kind of steered me in the direction of doing special education. I didn't know I was doing special education when I went into um, college per se, but I knew I wanted to help children who were having a hard time learning in class. So it wouldn't be so obvious because, and Marky, I left high school um, quite a while ago. All right, so our workshop expectations, uh, Dr. Dice alluded to this. Um, mute your microphones while we're on. Um, of course, until we get to the breakout rooms. I put cap uh, the cameras optional, but Dr. Dice says we need to keep it on. And of course, any questions, please feel free to use the chat box. Um, so let's get started. In special education in general, there are a number of areas that are considered special need. This uh, graphic right here, I took from the Education Endowment Foundation of the UK. Um, it did a guidance report on the special education needs in mainstream schools. So we know that the areas of special need in general have to do with cognition and learning, working of the brain, how students acquire information. Then you have the communication and interaction. So we're talking about speech. We're talking about those that perhaps may be um, on the spectrum, having, uh, 
having a place on the autism spectrum um, line. Then we have the social, emotional, and the mental health needs. Um, again, that has uh, more to do with students with behavioral challenges. Um, and again, basic mental health. We could try and figure out where that comes from. Uh, but anyway, and then of course, sensory and or physical needs, those that have physical disabilities, those that have issues with lighting and sound and touch, et cetera. Um, I think this part is very important that students diagnosed with a special need are individuals first. They are not their disability. Also, the challenge in special education is that, you know, I can say, uh, seat this child who's, you know, a mover who moves around a lot on one of those exercise balls and it will strengthen his core and he won't move around as much, but that might not work for another child. So strategies that works with one student may not work with another student, okay? But the key is to find the way that works for each individual student. I put, hey, how, how can you do that? And you can answer in the chat box, but I'll quickly give you one solution. Ask the student. That's the one piece in education that sometimes I think we miss that we don't ever ask the student, tell me how you feel. What works best for you? Um, how do you feel when? And a short five minute conversation with a student can really lead to success in class. And I'm not asking you about this one, I'm telling you it works. And it is a challenge I even have right now with students and teachers that I work with. I don't know why. Did you ask the child? No? Okay, why don't you ask? And then all of a sudden things become a little bit clearer and we know exactly how to um, motivate, assist and develop strategies for children. So, okay, today we're gonna to work on cognition and learning. Um, and shout, well, God willing, things happen well, we could probably get into a series, Dr. Dice, wink, wink, and we can deal with other disabilities. So today we're really going to work on cognition and learning and specifically learning disabilities. What is a learning disability? It is a neurological or genetic um, concern with a child that alters the brain functioning that um, affects cognitive processes that are related to learning. Okay, so we're talking about auditory processing, visual pro um, processing. Uh, we're talking about working memory. Um, again, when we're dealing with IQ, you know that there are different four areas that are really um, focused on to figure out an IQ. And usually when we identify students with learning disabilities, we will see one area that's a little bit deficient that can lead us into how to support the students. Of course, these problems interfere with the reading, writing, and math. And one of the big pieces that we forget sometimes is that it also interferes with long and short-term memory. That's what we're talking about when we say working memory and organization you know, planning, how to even think about thinking is um, part of their problem. Please know that students with learning disabilities. <laughs> students with learning disabilities have average to superior IQs. It has nothing to do and with um, being stupid or being dumb or being intellectual disabled, we don't usually classify a student who's intellectually disabled as having a learning disability in general. There are exceptions, but most students with learning disabilities have average to superior IQs. There's just one area in which um, they have deficiencies. So of course, you know this already that many, uh, the types of learning disabilities that are out there are dyslexia, difficulty with reading, can't identify speech and how they relate to letters and words, or they see uh, a word and they flip it. They can't tell the difference between a B, a D, a P, a Q. Um, we have dysgraphia, difficulty with writing skills, 
Again, they're not able to think and write at the same time. Um, and of course, poor legibility. And that has a lot to do with organization too. They're the ones that are not starting at the margin or they can't uh, figure out that this word is going to be too long for the sentence. So they squish up the letter or they continue on the second line. You know those kids. Um, and dyscalculia, which is difficulty understanding math, relationships in math and numbers. Um, and we're not talking about fear of math. We're talking about, I just don't get that. There are three items on the table and the numeral three is what represents those three items, all right? Again, similar to what I said uh, on the previous slide, we call them um, comorbid because it happens at the same time. There are some comorbid disorders that go along with many students with learning disabilities. And these disorders are, of course, the attention deficit disorder or the attention deficit hyperactive disorder, executive functioning deficits, that's the organization, and processing disorders such as auditory, language, uh, visual, disorders. So what's dyslexia? And I kind of put a lot on this slide because I think you guys, um, or many of us, already know what dyslexia kind of looks like. Again, I want to remind you that though they may have these concerns, these are students who can learn. It's the how that is most important. So dyslexia, confused by letters or words or sequences and even verbal explanations. They're really not hearing you or are they, and sometimes they're not even able to read an explanation and understand what it's saying. Uh, when they read, they skip over letters or, you know, those are the ones that forget about the vowels sometimes. There are substitutions, reversals in, in letters. Um, in early childhood, and we, we know about developmentally appropriate um, behaviors. In early childhood, a lot of times we will see students that will reverse numbers, right? That will reverse letters. And we consider that okay and that is um, developmentally appropriate. But when we get to grade five and we're still doing that, uh, there may be some strategies we need to institute for the student to be more successful. The dyslexic child is reading and rereads and rereads and still doesn't get what it's, what's happening. Um, many of the times, of course, that's because they're not able to identify the letters, the letter sounds, do it quickly enough um, to understand what they're reading. So by the time they get through a sentence, they spend so much time decoding that they don't have any idea um, what they just read. And that goes here into the fluency they're not fluent in reading, so their comprehension is reduced. However, you put, um, you give it to them orally, many of them, and they have it. They're right on it. They can explain everything. They can, you know, give you step by step. They can give you evidence and details because they've received it auditorily. So they read really slowly. Those are the ones that you sit in. You're like, oh my goodness, this is going to take forever. They don't read for pleasure. And of course, they're going to use a vocabulary that is simple, easy to use, and easy to spell. So what are some strategies that we can use for working with students like these, like this? Um, so again, explicit teaching. One of the things uh, that one of the buzzwords or items around town these days is um, using metacognitive strategies. And what that is, is that you're teaching students to think about how they're thinking. You're teaching them the process of what to do when. You're teaching them, um, again, with the, the same strategies, uh, and I, you know, when a bee is a bee, the stick is on the uh, uh, left, it's a bee if the stick is on the right, it's a D. You're teaching them these strategies. You're allowing them to quickly retrieve um, strategies that you've taught. Of course, with reading, we have to use research-based programs for reading. Um, there are a number of them, and in the resources at the end, I'll share that as well. Um, and again, the one, one of the ones that I promote a lot just because I've seen it work and it takes 10 to 15 minutes per day is toe by toe, 
where they're just quickly going through first um, letter names, then letter sounds, then CVC words, and it grows all the way to reading paragraphs. It's been an effective tool for students who are learning disabled, who have um, average cognitive ability, works beautifully. The use of gra graphic organizers, good teaching always chunks and scaffolds information and you know coming back to it reteaching of course technology is a big deal in um, teaching and learning these days um, using speech to text or text to speech that's one of the again i have a student specifically in my mind um, that she could not get her gather her thoughts together she couldn't write it by the time she was writing her words she forgot what she was thinking about and we use um the ipad or the tablet for her to record what she has to say then she can go back and edit it um in in word works beautiful beautifully for her last year and she's in grade nine and it really gave her a sense of success especially last year. Of course, we know about differentiating, differentiating material, the content, the process, the product, where this child is going to learn. And we'll go, get into that a little bit more shortly. And then, of course, making appropriate accommodations for the students. As we continue, I know, again, this is for general ed teachers. Um, and I'll bring this up later, but it is important that you do have good relationships with the special ed support people that are in your building. Um, I applaud you because again, doing these workshops and doing your research will really give you um, clear ideas on how to address uh, the needs of students um, with learning disabilities. So dysgraphia, what are characteristics and strategies having to uh, for dysgraphia. So you see that kid that, you know, is holding the pencil really, really hard, can't even get through writing one word without being exhausted. Like I said earlier, the, all the words are chunked together. They don't know anything about um, a finger space or again, word falling off the page or going around to the next line. You know, they're always erasing because they, they don't know if what they wrote was correct or um, they, it is incorrect and they can't figure out which way to do it. So they're more obsessed with uh, erasing. Uh, poor spelling as well, unfinished words, missing letters. So you see there's a little bit of combination with um, dyslexia there as well. Maybe the way the wrist or the position of the paper while they're writing Again, just because somebody writes with their hand in a funny position doesn't mean they have dysgraphia. It's when it's a combination of all these things. I think of a cousin of mine that he wrote really odd with his left hand on this left-handed day. And, um, but he wrote faster than I did and prettier than I did. He was not dysgraphic. He just learned a different way and it was okay. And of course, kids with dysgraphia have the issue with writing and thinking at the same time. So sitting in class and taking notes while the teacher is doing a lecture just does not work very well for a child with dysgraphia. So what are some of the things that we can do for students with dysgraphia? What are some strategies? So maybe shorter writing assignments or slightly different questions from classmates. Maybe we can use a computer to write instead or to type responses. Again, where appropriate and where accessible. I know one of the challenges um, that was put in the chat was about resources. I, I understand that. But for those that do have access to the technology, again, we don't have to think about the child with dysgraphia now doesn't have to think about what the B really looks like. It's right there and they can just type it in, yeah? So maybe we, since they are not taking notes, maybe we're going to give them copies of our PowerPoint. Maybe we're going to give them um, copies of our of uh, class notes with maybe 
main ideas missing, so they're only filling in um, shorter pieces of information. Using voice to dictation machine or electronic note taker, like I said, voice to text also works on a tablet. Um, an option to record the lectures. That's another thing that we do in class. The other thing we do is that we have our PowerPoints accessible to the students. It's another area in terms of resources, I understand, but if you're there or if you can get it done, get it done, you know, start. Um, when students are handing in work, perhaps they're doing video or they're doing audio reports instead of fully written out assignments. And again, oral assessments instead of written exams. I know this cannot happen all the time, but while we're doing in class things and we're, we're teaching the students how to write and how to address their disabilities, there are other things we can do in the meantime. We're continuously assessing, not all assessments within our class have to be written. Dyscalculia, oh my goodness. Um, so this child that has this uh, learning disability in math has difficulty telling time, managing time, um, understanding sequences. Uh, they're still using their fingers to calculate in math. Again, using your fingers to calculate doesn't mean you're discal you have dyscalculia, but again, this is just one of the characteristics. Um, knows, can calculate things in their head perhaps, but when you say, all right, show me, write it, it's just not coming, being able to form the letters, etc. it's not happening. Uh, fails at doing word problems, don't understand higher levels of math, um, and like I said, you know, unable to match um, a numeral to a set of numbers. So what are, what are some of the strategies? The use of a calculator maybe, giving a child step-by-step -step directions on how to uh, complete a word problem or a multi-step problem. Again, I go back to the scaffolding and chunking of information and differentiating accommodations. Use of manipulatives. Again, we're talking about being able to um, use these things while we're teaching, again, one, the metacognitive strategies to be able to complete um, such problems. We're just giving them the strategies until it becomes automated that they can do it on their own. So yes, our intervention starts really early. One of the um, comments in the chat about your challenges is that uh, many times the assessments take too long um, and we miss out or the child misses out on intervention. However, as a classroom teacher, you know you've done this, this is what works, this is the step that this child is at. You just pass that on to the next teacher, whether or not there's a formal assessment, if these are things that are working and you feel the child needs it, you pass it on. So the use of mnemonics, right? Um, I think it was BODMAS or BOMDAS is one of them for um, order of operations. We say PEMDAS um, over here. Uh, so the parentheses exponents and it works when we teach them these things and then how to solve it. I'll give you a really quick story for this one. This student actually is not learning disabled. She is intellectually disabled. She's actually on the spectrum. Um, we were doing an assessment and for assessments in our school for the special needs students, we actually do pull them out of the class and give them, you know, extra time or small group and help with reading of the problems. So one of her accommodations is to be able to use a calculator. Well, you know, well, first of all, we had to teach her how to use the calculator first step. Um, and she was proficient at that. Um, and it was a test on order of operations. So now if you know how to use a calculator and you put in a, a equation um, or a problem using order of operations, it's just easily going to calculate it. We already know that, yeah? Uh, you know how to use your brackets, you know how to use exponents on the calculator, et cetera. It's just gonna automatically um, do it. So I was challenged 
um, as an administrator when I was watching her do this. And I said to her, sweetie, what are you doing? Miss, I do order operations. I said, yes, but how do you do it? Can you do it without the calculator? She said, yes, miss. I said, tell me, what is it? How do you do it? She went through the metacognitive process that she was taught. She said, Miss, first you write PEMDAS. I said, okay, great. What does that mean? Miss, and she explained it beautifully to me. I said, okay, so can you do this one problem using it? She was able to beautifully work it out without the calculator, but that session took a good 10 minutes for one problem. Does she understand order of operations? Yes. Did she remember PEMDAS? Yes. So her accommodation in using the calculator is more about time, okay? But again, this was a child with an intellectual disability. She was taught how to think about the um, working out order of operations, and then she was given the accommodation of using a calculator where she could do the same amount of problems as her peers in about the same amount of time. Point is, not learning disabled, but intellectually disabled. And because she was taught, there was repetition, we scaffolded, we came back, we left it alone, she was able to do it. So these things do work with students. And again, partnering with other children is also helpful, uh, a helpful strategy. Using peer and buddy system is helpful for all, um, many, of these uh, disabilities. So other extremely important um, strategies. Again, one of the comments was the parent partnership um, is very, very difficult in, in many situations, but it's important to teach students and parents about the disability. What does this mean? It doesn't mean you're stupid. Any child, any parent, and again, that's also a problem we have over here. When parents hear that their child needs um, extra help or they're not doing well, they think it's a reflection on them. And this is one of the pieces we have to get out of. We can't blame a parent. It is what it is. What are the things that you can do to overcome this? Um, from the last session, the question was, how do you get parents on board? I liken disabilities to uh, medical conditions. So you're telling me for your blood pressure, you're just going to ignore it? Or are you gonna take something that's going to help normalize and get it to what it's supposed to be? That's the purpose of identifying your child as being dyslexic. We know what he needs and wherever she goes along the way, people know how to address her needs. And also she knows what to do in order to um, overcome whatever challenges she may have. So teaching students about the disability, no, you're not stupid, sweetheart. You just have a problem with confusing letters. So I'm gonna show you one way when you see it to figure out it works. Um, supporting and praising students. Listen, when we think of you know, the very beginning of um, our life learning to be teachers, we talked about Maslow's hierarchy of need, right? And the first, the bottom, the most basic need is that sense of safety and love, right? We need to let these children know that this is an okay place to make mistakes. We need to praise them when they're doing um, what we want them to do. They may not be getting 100%, but they're getting pretty close. We let them know why you're praising them. You know what? You sat through that lesson for 10 minutes without moving. I am so proud that you were so focused today. Let's see if we can move it to 15 minutes tomorrow. Little things like that so they know what their targets are as you're praising them. Yes, time and patience is another one. And um, collaborating with students, with students in your class, with uh, the parents, of course, and other professionals um, in your building. Uh, there was something I wanted to say about that piece. I forgot, moving on. Some of you may have seen this already, but it is my favorite graphic. 
and I use it every single time. People are gonna get so sick of it, especially at my school, but I need to drive home the point. It's not about everybody receiving the same thing. That doesn't help, yeah? It's about each person receiving what it is that they need to be successful. And as teachers, as we implement these strategies, um, the need for support may change. As this little one gets a little bit taller, he won't need two crates to stand upon to teeth a look at the game, right? He may only need one. Alrighty. I'm going to fly through this a little um, just because I think you're going to get to it when we talk about our case studies. Uh, but somebody writing on my page. Um, in terms of differentiating material, one of the challenges also came up um, that you, uh, one of our colleagues wrote in the chat box is how I, I don't have time to differentiate. I believe, and if I'm wrong, you can send me a note later. I believe um, good teaching, outstanding teaching takes into consideration all students in the class. And when you're planning a lesson, again, as outstanding teachers, we don't go into the classroom and open up the book and say, okay, let me just teach from the book. We're planning as we're going along. And as we're planning, because we have had conversation with students, we know our students very well because we have done learning style inventories, um, whatever. As you're planning your lessons, you're thinking, oh, you know what? This is what I'm going to need to give Shari so that um, she'll be able to get it. As you're planning, all these things are in your head and you're just writing them down and preparing them as well. Again, using your own metacognitive strategies to be able to address the needs of all students in your class. And um, the more you do it, the easier it becomes. Yes, I'm not saying differentiating is, 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 is very easy to do. It is a challenge, but the more you change your thinking, the more you think about the students in your class, plus the outcomes, the easier it is going to be to differentiate. The more you play around with um, tools and strategies, the easier it is going to be for you to say, oh yes, you know what would work? This would work in that situation. So the content, how are you going to present the information to the student and a little bit of how they're going to learn the information that you present, right? So the use of audiobooks. If a kid is not going to be able to read the text, why can't we have it for them on, on, as in an audio version as well? So they're following along. It also helps when you say to the student, you know what, tomorrow you're going to read chapter five, verse three. I'm gonna call on you in class. So go home, read along with the audiobook so you're prepared to read it out loud in class. Again, giving them the strategies to be successful in front of their peers as well using word lists and word banks and centers. And of course, teaching, when we teach, we're not going to just sit and lecture um, at students, but we're going to present information in multiple formats, auditorily, visually, and um, you know, where possible, we're doing the touchy-feely as well. One of the benefits I will tell you in our situation here with COVID um, is that you know, we had the online learning, which pushed teachers not only to have these PowerPoint presentations online, but they also had to do voice recordings with it and, you know, perhaps have animations or links for students to be able to go to to see further explanation. For my special education needs students, online learning for the last month of it was extremely successful once they got into the routine and the habit. And yes, we did do one-on-one -on -one sessions with them. It made it so much easier for learning because they're like, oh, miss, she recorded her voice. I didn't have to read the two pages on my own. It reduced the cognitive overload and reduced the pressure on the child so they could actually focus on content of the material, yeah? The process is how they're going to learn the information, okay. I won't be too long now. How they're gonna learn the information. I mean, or how much time will they need to complete the task? Will they be able to use manipulatives or not? You know, the levels of 
the activities. Uh, we use, um, in math class especially, we use, you know, bronze, silver, gold. And we know the bronze problems are a little bit simpler, not too much um, in terms of steps, etc. And then our gold has similar problems, but also goes into word problems. So there are multiple, I can address multiple students in the class. The interesting thing about our tiered activities is that there are times when teachers will assign students specific activities and there are times when students can choose which one to do. So you may have a student that's really on a bronze level that says, you know what, I really get this this time. I'm going to go for silver or gold. And that is their choice. However, we never allow those that are on gold and we know their gold standard to do um, the bronze. Again, process using a peers to also assist other peers. Extremely helpful in the class. The product, what are the students going to do to demonstrate their learning? So we talked about, again, sure, at the end of the year, many times there is a pen and paper assessment that we have to do, that we no stopping it. But during the school year, what are other ways that students can present information to demonstrate their understanding of the concept? That's the product. Here's what this child did. They totally understand the uh, branches of government. Sure, it wasn't a 10 page paper, but they did a PowerPoint and used graphics from the internet or they drew it out, whatever the case may be. And then of course, how the learning takes place. Uh, sorry, where and how the learning takes place. Sometimes in the classroom, perhaps we have to pull them out. Like I said, many of my students for um, assessments, we do pull them out because it's a little bit less distracting. Um, for dyslex students with dyslexia, many times uh, the contrast between the typing on a piece of paper and the white, the black and the white is too much for them. Just doing what we call colored laminates or overlays does help. And these are things that you can do in class. Sometimes it's literally turning the desk. You know what, Miss, I'm better when I can't see anybody. Can I turn my desk and sit in the corner? Sure, if that's what works for you, okay? And of course, when we talk about the environment, I put online because that's where we have been. Uh, this is just a quick list of accommodations. Um, again, these are the sports, the supports that we're giving students. There is uh, a link and uh, copies on the resources uh, tab. So again, while you're doing your planning, while you're differentiating, you're thinking, okay, what is Sherry going to need to be successful? You know what? She can't figure out these math problems so well, so I will check on her regularly. So after each problem, she has to come to me and show, so she doesn't do 10 of them wrong. Um, I can check in on her uh, uh, regularly. Ah, here's a writing assignment. You know what? She's going to need to come in a little bit earlier to get started. So we've extended the time for her. Um, you know what? This one needs a little bit of a step-by-step -step direction on following. Let me make sure that that is provided. As you're planning your lessons, all these accommodations, the things that the children need are there for you to um, put in or add as you're planning. So how can you be an inclusive student? Teacher, for me, get to know your student. Once you know your students, all of a sudden it's like the light bulb for us um, gets turned on. Ask them the question. Miss, it's boring. I don't like, is it boring? You don't like learning about ABA? What does this have to do with my life, Miss? And these are all these um, deflecting strategies that kids use, you know, so they're not held accountable. But once they can trust you, they will definitely share what works, what doesn't work. You know, I have it to the point where students were telling me, Miss, her voice annoys me. I can't stand hearing this teacher's voice. It's too high pitched. That's actually an auditory processing issue. It's not being mean. It is an auditory processing issue. So I have to ask again, what would help? Work through it. Collaborate, collaborate, collaborate. Like I said, many of our uh, learning disabled students have strengths. Use those strengths to develop the challenges. 
uh, use a var variety of modalities, like I said. Um, the model, model, model. Once again, going back to metacognitive strategies, when you're teaching, when you're standing up there in front of the classroom, you are modeling the metacognitive strategy. You are modeling, modeling hmm, I don't know what that word means. So usually I have to figure out the context. Let me read the sentence before and after to see if I understand the meaning of that word. When you read the sentence before, you read the sentence after, you go, oh, so that word must mean, or maybe mm, I still don't understand. Let me check a thesaurus or let me check my this or whatever. Model these strategies repetitively. Uh, have the students model it for each other. Put those challenges in, yeah? And of course, be an advocate. Okay, I've done a lot of talking. Um, Dr. Dice, I'm gonna need you to help me for a minute. Uh, so we're gonna use breakout rooms. There are a lot of people in here. I didn't expect this amount, but let's see how we can uh, do this. Uh, yes. uh, we have quite, quite a lot of people now. Um, say again, Dr. Dice? We, we, have, um, we have quite a lot of people now, so um, we, we could do the breakout room, but it's gonna be quite a few in each. Well, let's just it's try. About 50. It's oh be my about 50. Yeah. See, I put no more than 20 in the group, um, but it's okay. Let's, let's, why don't we try it? You try, know? Yeah, yeah, we can try, yes. Let's try. All right. So you're going to join. A, um, we're going to do the breakout rooms. Uh, one member is going to share their screen, write the case study number, and record the conversation. So the room is going to be according to your case study. Okay. I'll give you 10 minutes because they're really short and I also want to hear your responses. And while you're doing that, I'm also going to look at your comments to see if I can answer any of the question. Um, so the case studies are really short. So you're going to answer or discuss in your group for 10 minutes, what is the challenge with such a student in your class of having this kind of a student with your class? My goodness, I forgot the question marks after, sorry. And <laughs> <laughs> teaching, um, what strategies would you use to create success for the student? Okay, those are the things that I'd like you to uh, discuss as you're going through it. Um, here are the, I'm gonna put the case studies up. So what we're gonna do is share, when we create the room, we'll just share the case studies to everybody. So you can see. Okay, um, great. Yeah. You ready? Five rooms? Uh, five rooms, go right okay. ahead. Um, now, the, the folks who are asking about breakout, you just accept, accept going into a breakout room once you get it. It's going to be one, two, three, four, five. Breakout room one, two, three, four, five. And you just accept one of those rooms, whichever one you got. It, it's going to be automatic. They put you in a room. And then what we do want is somebody just randomly choose to lead the room, choose to share your screen, and just start sharing ideas about the case study, okay? As according to what Ms. Franklin just said. Um, let me see if there's any, are there any question as to how we're gonna do this in the breakout room from anyone? Because it's very simple, go in the room and then um, among yourselves, similar to what we have done in the past, um, someone just choose to lead in the room, share your screen and um, and talk among yourselves about the, the case study that is being presented, okay? Um, whichever room you're in, check the number, um, room number one, two, three, four, five, and we're going to share the case studies once you get in the rooms, okay? So you know which one you are. Just check the breakout room number um, on top of the screen that you'll be in. Just wait for a second. Um, Um, for those who are asking how to get in the breakout room, you'll get the notification in a couple of seconds. So don't worry about getting in. Worry about the participation part. Okay. All right. Hang on. Oops.
Sherry, don't accept, okay? Okay, no, no, I'm reading comments. I'm trying to get to Kato. Okay, good, okay. Tell me when they're in the room so I can start my 10 minute timer, please. Okay, we're slowly getting there. Um, yeah, people are moving, you. they're moving. Okay, tell me when yes. you Get into breakout rooms, everybody. All right. Um, let me go back to um, what I wanted to do is see if you, because you're a co host, see if you can share the document in all rooms since everybody is in a breakout room now. Who's that? Not me. You, yeah, yeah, you, you. Just the same, the same document you, you put up right here. Mm. Yeah, share it in, see if you can share in a message to all, it said broadcast a message to all. Click on, um, do you see the breakout room icon at the bottom? I do not have the breakout room icon on my, hold on. Hold on, let me, you're gonna get you. Yes, um, room, okay. Pardon? Yeah, I got breakout rooms. Or what you can do, go into each of them and share it. You can go in and out of breakout rooms. I just can't find you right here. Why can't I find you? So I need to stop share then. Yeah, stop sharing and then go share it in. Yeah, we need, um, those who are not assigned yet, you really need to get into a breakout room. Everyone who is not assigned, go into a breakout room. Choose. Choose to go into accept, accept. Quite a few of you have accepted. Sorry, sorry. Those of us who are not in a breakout room, please go in at this time. Accept, there's a, um, Shari, you're muted. Hold on one second. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, all right, so I did breakout room number two. So I'm gonna go to each one of them and share it, yeah? yeah yes, please, yeah, do that quickly. And I said it for 50 something minutes. Um. But it's you. But you assigned me to breakout number two. Oh, I need to stop you from going. Um, what I can do is, uh, oh, breakout number two. Okay. I did two already. So give me another one. Um, give me the others. To find your, All right, here you go. All right, I'm gonna move you to. Move you to. Um, I just move you around. You did two already, so let put you in room one. And then I'll move you to the next one quickly. Okay. Those of us who are on the screen, you still haven't been in a breakout room, you need to get to a breakout room. Those of us who are still on the screen. All right, ready again? <laughs> okay. Ooh, ooh, ooh. 
Oh, I can't find your name. Sorry. Well, I'm sorry, I can't find your name. All right, there you go. Okay, so you're going to go over to three and then come back quickly. Ready again? Yeah, they, they had it already. Oh, wow. That's good. All right. So let's go to four. That's very good. They're clicking away. All right, four. There you go. Hold on, babe. Ready again? The last one. <laughs> the last one. Wait, wait. Can you give them per uh, accessibility permission to annotate? Um. Okay. Well, I don't think they can annotate in the breakout room. Okay. No problem. Let's move on. Yeah. Yes. All right. Hang on. The fifth one. You're getting over to the fifth. All right. There you go. Yes. And leave me in there. I'm going to hang out for a while in there. Okay. Okay. How long are, is it though? Are you staying for everybody? Like twenty-five minutes? I told them ten minutes, but yes, let's let them go. It's fine. Okay, so ten minutes two. past the hour, we'll come by. Mm, all right. Sounds okay. good. Okay. Okay. The initial uh, Hi, everybody. instructions that were the initial instructions Hi. that were given before we went into the breakout room that was a part of okay. it. Okay. So one part of it was um, what is the challenge of having such a student in your class, and the, the next part would be what strategy is you breaking up. <clears throat> I hear a lot of info. Sorry, I hear a lot of um, discussion as it relates to. And the strategies, but strategies. we did not look at the first part. So, yeah, what mm. kind of challenges would would um, mm. Jerome would Jerome have in a classroom? Well, one since he's not recording. One it, since it, he's it. not remembering the steps, he will not get the this um the problem. All right, sorry. Wait, you're muted. Yes. No, I was looking for to see if I can answer the question. Oh. Everything good? 
Everything is good. Um, I went into a few rooms. They're working. I was pleasantly surprised. Very nice. Yeah, they're they're doing well. So a few people asked for help, but um, well, when I went in there, they don't really need any help. They're discussing, so I don't know why. It's all about the discussion. That's really what I wanted to get going. Yeah. Discussion. I'm gonna remove a few people because they're not participating. You know, if you look in the chat, there was one that said she couldn't get in. She, hers kept dropping off because she was on this, that, and. Oh. Yeah, so I wouldn't take them off because I think they're trying. One was driving and it, internet. She said it in the chat, keep, kept dropping off. Okay. Share me a Oh, I don't know what's going on with them. This is making me want to come go home. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> Let me, I'm going to swing into each of the rooms again and then see how. I think I, I think I still have access to five, so I'll, I'll go into five. Yeah, um, yeah, what I'm going to do in the future, well, when you come back again, not to assign you to a room, I think, because I assign you. That's why. If you just stay open, then you could just join as a co-host. Yeah. All right. I'll see you in a little while. How is the discussion going, everybody? Well, so far so good. Okay. What's what's your um what's your your case study? Number case study one. one. Case study one. What is that about again? I don't have it up on my screen anymore. What is it about? Uh, who to the question? Someone. Ronald is a great core student mm -hmm. who receives special education services for this for the subjects in reading and mathematics. Okay. He has difficulty in all areas of reading, such as decoding words, blends, and frequently used sight words. What strategies or accommodations can be utilized to address the students? Okay. All right, thank you, uh, Ms. Fraser. Also, we could do color coding for um, math symbols. Yes, that's a good one. Is somebody writing down to share? We want one person to share. Yes, somebody's writing. Oh, good, good. Very good. Excellent. Very, very good. You should also take into consideration the environment. The environment. give it more than one ways to solve it and the one that he understand the best that's the one that yes, we that, that, he that, could uh, use so good. instead of just push down one method down his throat that he may not understand you show right. him different ones okay. yeah. Yeah. um it's it's the, the case study says that he has attended after school tutoring yeah. and he period but if I give them a language yeah. text and asking them about when they go sharp, then get it to your same way. They get it to your quick and fast. So probably this was today for us to tap into it also. So probably what we really life experience yeah. of it's them. True. Yeah. yeah. Whatever we're trying to yeah. get out of yeah. her. Yeah. real life experience. In a yeah. mathematical way. In a scenario. So you give them a mathematics scenario, yes. That's that could right. be good. Yes. Yeah. Also one of the strategies <laughs> Use the mnemonics like bomb right. that you could um, 
use mnemonic so teach whatever else we are using uh, exactly. and they will and remember it let us go back to and go back to using the metacognition um one of the the like the dyslexia one of the learning disabilities that the teacher is not necessarily um doing differentiated learning for her she's not exactly she's not exactly it. you understand exactly. so there's something that she needs we the teacher now needs to put in place for the student because she can learn because she is high functioning meaning that she she probably is really good at the reasoning and everything because she was talking about the dyscalculia where if you if the teacher says it Oh. they'll get it. but for them to get it as a test or oh, and it's not something that's audio or something that she needs she won't be interested in it so that no oh. can be the reason why she's doing poorly in both tests and assignments because these things are things it is in a format that she cannot handle she knows her stuff but she just can't handle whatever format the test and the assignment go ahead it will never end mm -hmm. i like the idea that you um colleagues are also thinking of strategies seeing that he is a high school student right yeah. right we're not just talking about any you have a specific um aid to deal with all right you have about two minutes i'm going to jump out thank you okay, okay. and we must always okay. always provide a very quiet place quiet space for him to work because if there's any distraction um, it will disturb his what do you say it will distract him easily any kind of noise yeah that's true i agree with that one too and uh, always um, give him extra time on the test why <laughs> give him an extra time on the test because remember, you know, as such, normal children also answer for a math test. So we have to keep that in. Very good, Shari. Very, very good. I've been through all of them. Wait, what's going on? Shari, you're trying to confuse my eyes. All right, I'm going to close this down so everybody can come by. I'm not hearing you, know, because you're muted. I'm trying to find my PowerPoint back. Oh, all right. Let me um, wait. Yeah, yeah, 30 I'm seconds. I'm closing. All right. Yeah, they're going to get um, one minute. Okay. See if I can find. Find your PowerPoint, yes. I See love the discussions. Oh, well, they're lovely. Very, very good discussions, yes. Where is this thing, my dear? Where did my PowerPoint go? Check, did you close it or you look at the bottom of the screen if you minimize it? You know what, because I did the link, here it is. I, okay. I oh, it's the link, you know. okay. There goes my timer. <laughs> Good timing. I embedded one as well, but I knew that wasn't going to work. You will have the resources available, yes? Yes. All right. Um, let me see. But you can continue with the next part. Okay. Um, so Dr. Dice said he jumped into a few of the um, breakout rooms, as did I. And it was really good to hear uh, each of you discussing 
many options for students and, and really focusing on the grade level that they're on and expectations based on the grade level that they're on. So Dr. Dice, um, mm -hmm. I'm going to just ask for maybe one, I should go back to the thing, one discussion from each, each group. That's yeah. fine, yes, totally fine. All right, so let me go back to the case study for a second. Yeah. All right, so would you open up uh, someone from the group? Have you unmuted everyone? Yeah, um, I enabled um, anyone to unmute themselves, but only okay. the leader for each group, the, the, yeah, share, the person is sharing from each group. So you can unmute yourself um, however you like. So somebody from group case study one with Ronald, could you please share a couple of your ideas? To unmute, unmute yourself. yourself. <laughs> okay. I'm going to move to case study number two. I'll come back okay. to number one. Oh. Are you ready? Okay. <laughs> All right, so I'll just share on behalf of the group. Thank now, you. Now, we identified this student has um, dyslexia and dyscalculia. And we, for the dyslexia, we decided that we'd allow the child to use uh, audio books, um, repeated reading, uh, we'd make recordings for this child. Also, we'd use things like um, flashcards, modify, modified assignments, and we also would also involve peer teaching where this child maybe works along with um, other peers with, this, with similar disability um, to do reading activities, et cetera. And we also could involve games for this particular student. For the, the math um, disability, we decided that we could include like games, math games from YouTube. Uh, we have a lot of apps with different games. Um, also teacher made games and also the peer teaching strategy that we mentioned. We could use also manipulatives, allow the child to also reread the question and we take into consideration things like the age level of the child because also the environment, ensuring that environment is conducive to learning and color coding math symbols, etc. Uh, thank you, uh, group one. That was well done. Very yeah. good. See how easy it just flows. You know exactly what a kid needs. You guys are further ahead than you um, realize. Alrighty, so someone from case from group two. Thank you, Claudette. Let me see the case yeah. studies. It's right. on the screen. Um, good afternoon. Can you see it on the screen? The screen? Yes. So. No, the case studies aren't on the screen. All right. I'll, I'll read it out because it says it's sharing on my screen. So I apologize. But case study number two is Jerome is a fourth form student. Oh, I messed up. He does not receive educational services. He's able to recall basic math facts first. I edited this. This is the wrong one. However, when solving more complex math problems with algorithms, he's unable to remember the steps and often loses his place. Um, all the name different. Lord of mercy. Uh, it was supposed to be Jerome attended after school tutoring. However, scores on his class assignments and tests indicate his performance has not improved. Um, what strategies and accommodations? Who for group two? All right, so for Jerome, we have identified his learning challenge as being this calculator. Um, the challenge that would exist with Jerome in a class, we, were, we identified that he may be disruptive, he may be withdrawn, and um, his class participation may be limited. He may have poor self-concept um, and poor self-esteem, and he may refuse to complete given assignment. Um, the strategies that we came up with, so the first one would use visual aids um, as it relates to charts or so to assist him with remembering step-by-step -step directions 
in completing um, mathematical problems. Also, we said we'd use spare tutoring, somebody, um, so peer body that would use to assist because students sometimes they, they may have a challenge learning it on their own or from the teacher, but they may understand it if the pair explains it to them. So um, we'd, we'd use that. So we'd also use technology. Um, we'd identified um, YouTube step-by-step -step tutorials that would assist in remembering the, the steps um, that are of difficulties. Um, would give him multiple chances of solving a problem. Instead of having one go at it, he would get a chance to, to do the problem over and over. And of course, he would be rewarded um, for any small improvements or any small progress that he would have made. Um, would also use music um, to assist in remembering steps and um, Chunking was one of the things that was identified as one of the strategies that could be used to assist the room as well. So, Lovely, Alicia. Thank you for sharing. Um, one of the strategies also that was mentioned is using colored pencils. So, you know, I finished step one. That one was done in green. I'm going to go to step two, so I'm going to use a different color. Again, just training his mind in moving from one step to the next. Well done. Thank Let's you. to another. Yeah. Thank Alrighty, case study number three. Uh, Jennifer is a first form student who receives special education services to address, Lord have mercy, her needs related to a physical disability. She does not struggle with mathematics, reasoning and computation. However, she is only able to write with a pencil for short amounts of time because her muscles become fatigued easily and begin to cramp. Who's doing case? Number three, case study number three. Can unmute yourself and, and just present from group three. Unmute yourself. Hello, everybody. So from group three, mm -hmm. we identified that the student uh, has dysgraphia and the, sorry, I'm just trying to get to the notes here. Right, so the strategies we looked at, we could first and foremost ask the child what method could be used, what method are they comfortable with, with, for example, presenting their work or accessing their work. Uh, we spoke about peer work, someone she could share orally while someone could write. Uh, we could record on tablets, we could use manipulatives, use real life experiences, mnemonics, have her practice copying for short periods of time and then increase, increase the time. So we're trying now to just get her to become more comfortable and to practice using those muscles. Um, differentiated resources, more use of technology that she can access, of course, lots of praise so she doesn't feel like she's different from anyone else in the classroom, um, exemptions with regards to assessments, for example, extra time and so on, or probably someone reading to her or, or being her scribe, ongoing activities to help to strengthen the muscles and copies of class notes where a highlighter could be used to, just to show important points or so on. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Otte. As well as one of the other things that they put on, you know, instead of her having to write out too much, maybe give her multiple choice options. So she's just circling in or highlighting the response, the, the correct answer. Yeah, well, yes, well done. Um, I had something else to say on that, but I'm going to move on. All right. Well done. So case study number five. Four. <clears throat> Four. All right. Good evening, everyone. Okay. So for case study number four, all right, I'm going to read it first and foremost. Okay. So Tanya is a high functioning student. However, her parents are concerned that she's doing poorly in class 
because she does not study for tests and is missing assignments in your class. What strategies, accommodations could be utilized to address this student's need? So the first thing we did was we identified the problem as Tanya being dyslexic. Um, chances are some of the characteristics that we were able to pick up from the case study was possibly not understanding written instruction that would be um, given in a test because most of our tests would be paper and pen, right? And so we were looking also at the possible strategies. So normally, as our presenter had said earlier, for dyslexic children, especially since in the case study it said she's highly functioning, then chances are she may be good at explaining all right, so she can use simple vocab. So it means that instead of having a paper and pen test, we could have an oral examination. It may also mean that the fact that she's not performing at the, for the test or these assignments is probably because the level at which the tests and assignments are being set is probably a little bit below where she's at, so she's not interested. So we're definitely looking at differentiating not just the instruction, but also the assessment itself. And the very first strategy that we really should have employed, which our, our group member suggested, as well as our presenter, is that, you know, if the child is not performing, the first thing we need to do is ask her why, okay? Why is it that we're losing her? You know, what's the reason? Is it that, you know, the information is not stimulating enough or are there other issues? Right, so we can plan as many strategies as possible, but if we don't cover that base first, then we're going at it in vain. All right, but well, let's say that we have asked her why, okay, and we have picked up that, yes, dyslexia is going on. So we can try to be a bit more intentional in our teaching using metacognitive strategies. All right, so chunking the material um, and scaffolding, reteaching, using graphic organizers, um, using a lot of text-to-speech, making our PowerPoints and so on available to them so they can go through it at their own pace. And in general, just, you know, kind of praising the students, you know, giving her um, little tasks to kind of look forward to the next class so she knows that, okay, this is depending on me, for X, Y, and Z, and she feels accomplished. She feels a sense of safety and love, etc. All right. And then also, in order to try and motivate her, they were also suggesting the tearing method. All right. Our presenter had mentioned the whole bronze, silver, and gold thing in terms of math problems or, and so on. But I guess we could do it also with reading issues. Um, one of our group members has suggested a try, fly, and soar technique where you would create um, different activities at different levels. And I am looking to see if I have covered everything. I do believe so. Remember, if I haven't, please tell me. <laughs> you guys have covered quite a bit. Um, and it's very interesting that when you know, things are presented. I had one thing in mind when I gave this, this, this case study and you guys went in a totally different direction, which is clear how things can be misinterpreted even by, you know, by us. It's not misinterpretation, can be seen in a different way. This child has an issue with dyslexia more than likely, but also executive functioning. She's not an organized child. She don't know when our test is, she forgets to study, et cetera, et cetera, right? High functioning. If she studied, she would be fine. But yes, you are right. It could be dyslexia. And the first thing to do with a student like this, you are very clear. What's going on? Talk to me. Perfect. Lovely. Thank you, uh, group four. Last one. Marcus is in case five. Breakout room number five. I yes. can't go back well, to bed. Okay. Go ahead, please. Yes, good evening. Yes, Marcos, we identified that Marcos' challenge is 
miscalculus because he's having problem with algebra. You know, algebra, algebra is a mathematical section there. And so therefore, this calculus is the challenge. So first, for our strategy, the teacher will definitely love to do an assessment to find out the strengths and the weaknesses in the subject area. So that is very important. So the teacher would want to know exactly where Marcus is not understanding because sometimes they will understand to a point and then get lost after that. So we want to find out the strength and the weaknesses first. We also want to find out his learning styles. So that will have to be done, you know, at the beginning of the term. So the teacher will definitely will have to do that as first assessment. Find out the, the child learning style. How does he learn best? And then we will use that now in our strategies. Uh, we were looking at the step-by-step -step, uh, directions. This is where Marcus will have a one-on-one -on -one with the teacher. So using the strengths and the weaknesses as a backup, also as a learning style, as a tool to find out exactly how they're going to bring across the lesson. Once the assessment is done, the teacher will have to do the personalized lesson plan to cater for this child, definitely. And so we'll have to do the step-by-step Direction. So you build on what he knows already in in the assessment with the weakness and this right now. We're trying to see if we can build on the weaknesses that he has. So step by step direction is definitely. Since he's also in high school, I think he said fourth form. So you know you can also use a calculator. And we want to use what Marcus already has or his interests. So his likes and his dislikes. So take for example, he loves football or basketball we will integrate these his likes and his dislikes into the lesson planning also to bring across the subject in such a way that you will be able to understand sometimes children they, they don't learn just by looking at the thing but bringing it into like a reality setting um you're, you're, you're taking the the problem of the paper and you're showing them that this also is math because we know that math is everywhere, math is everything, right? So even in football and basketball, etc., there is mathematics. And just by waking up and going to a bed and doing everything is mathematics. So we're going to put this problem to him in such a way that he recognizes that it's everyday life, right? So we want to build. So that is this cost scaffolding that is the scaffolding so we're going to help him to build and climb the ladder all the way up until he can understand and then now we can take away the scaffolding and let him go on on his own so it during the scaffolding we will use different type of materials a learning teaching aids and so on the, he probably loves um yes for and the game thing and so on you know you you utilize the technology definitely because children at those days, at age, you know that they understand technology even more than the teacher themselves. So we will have to do that. So instead of the pen and the paper, you will do something, something hands on for him to understand what algebra is. Uh, what else? We also look at manipulatives. So you will definitely have to have hands-on materials to work with and hands-on meaning anything at all that you can take in your simple environment home environment school environment you can use them you're going uh, for me we teach i teach the basic schools you know we can actually go outside and you pick up some stones or you take some sticks and so on so it's pretty much the same thing that you will continue to do with the high school student, but you know, at a higher level. Also, the assessment at the end of it also is very, very important because you want to find out if learning has taken place. So you do your summative assessment of the student, and then now you can go back to your, your objectives, like your term objectives for that child, and see if the objectives were met or see if anything that you can do that is different or anything can be added for the next term or time to come for this child to truly understand. So if 
all these strategies were put in place and utilized, the child should have grasped something. But if not, then the teacher will have to go back to the drawing board or build if something happened in the positive sense. You just build on that for our next term. All right, Miss Williams, thank you very much. I mean, there were, I was in your group and there were a lot of discussion <laughs> around the fact that this is a high school student. We're going to have to put in things and then once he gets it there, we're going to pull it back a little bit. We're going to use simply just turn his notebook one way so the columns are lined up so he can go step by step. A number of different strategies. But I think in everything that we have discussed, um, the biggest deal is to um, make sure we ask the kid, ask the student, what is the most helpful for you? In um, the resources, I will also put this, and there are some, a few suggestions, very few suggestions as well. So it will be in uh, the resources for later. Um, let's see if I can get back to my slides. Uh, all righty, so that was our case study discussion. I, um, the takeaways from today, hopefully, is um, a child with a specific learning disability can learn. Though we have a learning challenge, if they're not all disabilities, somebody who writes funny, like I said, my cousin used to write with his finger, oh, it was ridiculous no learning disability. Just because he has a challenge in writing doesn't mean he has a disability. A learning disability is lifelong. It's the strategies that are used to overcome them. I actually went to um, a graduate course and one of the guys in the course, you know, stood up and said, look, we're studying special ed. Let me give you a live example. I have a learning disability. I am dyslexic. What takes you 10 minutes to complete, it takes me half an hour. I have to plan my life appropriately and use these strategies. So this is lifelong, yeah? Many students have other issues such as organization and attention concerns. And I go back, outstanding teaching and learning benefits all students. And it's your encouragement, your praise, your motivation, your belief in them their sense of safety and security with you that allows them to grow academically. Um, I will answer, uh, do I have five more minutes just to lump the questions that came in the chat, Dr. Dice? Uh, yes, yes, five minutes, exactly five minutes, because we're over by five now. Huh? We're over by five, but yes, five minutes, okay. yes. I'm, I'm sorry, I just want to address some of the questions. Um, okay. So, again, I always put up Albert Einstein as well. Didn't learn to read till he was nine, failed math. Just consider that when we're thinking of who we may um, be overlooking in our classroom because they have a disability. Okay, so when I looked at the, the comments as to what the greatest challenges were, there are quite a few things that came up. One was time. Um, not having enough time to differentiate. One was resources, the parent relationship, um, assessment, how to assess the fact that sometimes assessments don't happen in time for students who you realize does have a disability and would benefit from a real plan, um, student lack of interest. Uh, all of those things, I, hopefully, I have somewhat addressed. One of the pieces like time, resources in terms of physical resources is a challenge. And you know, as teachers, we always look for extra things and, and do more and pay out of our pocket more than we really should. That's something else. So I can't talk about ministry resources. Those are things that we're going to have to at some point, just as solid people uh, campaign them for. But in terms of time, um, when you think of your classroom management skills, that's very important when working with students with disabilities in your class, working with a variety of students. So I'd like you in terms of saying, I don't have enough time to address the needs. You're not the only one in the classroom. Think about how you can manage your class differently 
in order to address the needs of all students. So classroom management may be um, one piece that you need to investigate a little bit further. Um, the student lack of interest, I think we addressed it. When you figure out what they're interested in, use that as motivation, you're going to get a different student. Um, someone said, you know, yes, we do accommodations in the classroom, but on national exams, we don't have accommodations. Again, that's another fight um, or another challenge that slowly we, we work on. Even over here in the UAE, um, where we're really pushing this whole people of determination thing now, um, our national exams have not yet been modified, but it's a slow process. We will continue working on it. That's everywhere. The last thing that I wanted to quickly um, say is, one of the other questions was, how do we do all of this in virtual classrooms? Very similarly. If you can have, if you have your virtual classroom, you can still do, hey, Sherry, stay online for an extra five minutes. I want to talk to you about something. You still praise in your chat box. You still give um, big old shout outs on your screen. Hey, good job, um, Dwayne. You got seven out of 10 this time. What an achievement. You still do it the same way, similar ways that you do it um, in the classroom. Unfortunately, we can't touch. We may not be able to touch for a very long time. So the verbal um, praise, taking a little bit of extra time again, that extra five minutes that you take with the child could mean uh, a world of difference academically. Thank you. I hope this was helpful. Um, and of course, you know, anytime, I don't know about three o'clock in the morning again, but um, we, <laughs> anytime pretty much. All right, Dr. Dice, over to you. Thank you very much. Very Franklin. Um, a spe special thank you to her. I really enjoyed the presentation as well. Um, I'm not a special ed um, educator, but I understand quite a bit. And what the reason I'm saying that is in the in the general ed classroom, you find quite a lot of these challenges among students, and we need to identify them early. Um, and then get accommodations for these students because they're really depending on us as educators. So it's really good, very good uh, presentation a very good discussion as well. And I'm hoping that all of us will spread the, the, the presentation information to other um, teachers out there. Um, also, the, the presentation will be um, available uh, by tomorrow night, I think, um, to be um, distributed to everybody who has um, registered. So we have almost a thousand people registered. So even though they didn't get to come on the call, then um, they still will have the presentation. Um, and you can share it as much as possible with others um, out there. So thank you so much, uh, Miss Shari uh, uh, Franklin. And um, just as he said, we will have follow-ups um, throughout the year um, coming. Um, also,